Hello and welcome to this presentation on spinal cord lesions made for the Neurology and Neurosurgery Interest Group. My name is Dominic, I'm a final year medical student from Oxford. The presentation is aimed at medical students revising for finals. The presentation is going to be split into two main parts. The first one will be an anatomical overview of the most important tracts making up the spinal cord. And the second one will be a series of five clinical cases uh, in which we try and link the clinical presentation of a cord lesion to the underlying anatomy. If you already feel comfortable with basic anatomy of the spinal cord, then do feel free to skip forward in the video to around 9 minutes 30, 9 minutes 45, where you'll find the clinical cases. The spinal cord is essentially a bundle of white and grey matter that connects the brain stem and the brain above it to the rest of the body below. You could see it as a sort of nervous motorway, allowing efferent signals to travel from the brain downwards and afferent signals from the periphery upwards. But that's probably a slight oversimplification, uh, given the complex series of interneurons and feedback loops that exist in the cord, mediating processes such as reflex arcs. The cord itself sits in the spinal canal between the vertebral bodies anteriorly and the vertebral arches posteriorly. Using this cross-section of spinal cord, we're going to look at the anatomy of three particularly relevant tracts. Firstly, you have the dorsal columns, which unsurprisingly run dorsally in the cord and carry information on fine touch, vibration and proprioception from the periphery up towards the brain. Anterior laterally, you have the spinothalamic tracts, which carry information on pain and temperature from the periphery upwards. Laterally, you have the lateral corticospinal tracts, which are part of the lateral motor systems. These lateral corticospinal tracts carry efferent signals from the motor cortices downwards to mediate voluntary movement in peripheral musculature. We'll now recap the anatomy of these three systems in turn. So let's kick off by looking at the anatomy of the dorsal column medial lamiscus pathway. Fine touch, vibration or a proprioceptive stimulus results in the generation of an action potential in a peripheral neuron. That action potential is then carried centrally via a large diameter myelinated axon that enters the cord dorsally. Most of those axons are then incorporated into the ipsilateral dorsal columns, whereas a smaller number move towards the central gray to synapse on interneurons and mediate reflex arcs. It's important to remember that these peripheral neurons have their cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion. Axons within the dorsal column are, like many other structures within the CNS, arranged somatotopically, meaning that their layout is similar to that of the body as a whole. Information from the lower body is carried by more medial axons, whilst information from the upper body is carried more laterally. These two main pathways have different names, so more medially you have the gracile, meaning thin fasciculus, and laterally you have the cuneate, or wedge-shaped fasciculus. Remember that sensory information from the upper body isn't incorporated until the thoracic spinal cord, and so the cuneate fasciculus does not exist below the level of around T6. That means that the lumbar cord has a narrower diameter than the cervical cord. Once these axons have been incorporated, they move ipsilaterally upwards towards the brainstem. Eventually, those ascending axons will reach the caudal the medulla. At this point, there's only been one sensory neuron linking, say, the skin of your fingertip to your brainstem, and the cell body of that neuron sits in the dorsal root ganglion. Upon reaching the caudal the medulla, Fibres in the cuneate fasciculus will synapse with second-order neurons in the nucleus cuneatus, and fibres from the gracile fasciculus do the same in the nucleus gracilis. These second-order neurons then decussate, that means just switch over to the opposite side of the brainstem, as the internal arcuate fibres, and then keep ascending towards the thalamus as the medial lamiscus pathway. From the thalamus, fibres are sent all over the brain, but a good proportion go towards the sensory cortices, particularly S1, which is on the postcentral gyrus. So let's move on to the anatomy of the spinothalamic tract. The spinothalamic tract is one of the anterior lateral pathways that carries information on pain and temperature from the periphery upwards. There are some similarities between the anatomy of the dorsal column and spinothalamic tracts. Information for both pathways enters the cord dorsally and is carried by neurons whose cell bodies reside in the dorsal root ganglia. The neurons carrying pain and temperature information, however, tend to be thin and unmyelinated, which is different to the thick myelinated neurons that contribute to the dorsal columns. Another difference is that these thin neurons, upon entering the cord, 
synapse almost immediately in the marginal zone of the dorsal horn. These second order neurons then ascend or descend in the tract of Lisieux before moving centrally in the central grey and decussating through the anterior commissure. That decussation happens over two to three spinal levels. The second order neurons then ascend contralaterally through the cord and the brainstem in a somatotopic fashion and synapse on the ventroposterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus. The tract on its way also gives off some fibres to the reticular formation and periaqueductal grey, which are involved in the emotional processing and modulation of pain. We'll now move on to the anatomy of the corticospinal tracts. These are part of the lateral motor systems and are involved in the control of voluntary fine movements. Approximately 50% of fibres in the corticospinal tract originate in the primary motor cortex, which sits on the precentral gyrus. Others come from the supplementary motor area or the premotor cortex. These diffusely spread fibres condense down in the corona radiata to form the somatotopically arranged posterior limb of the internal capsule. This tight motor bundle then continues down through the cerebral peduncles and the ventral pons until it reaches the junction between the medulla and the cord. Upon reaching the cervical medullary junction, 85% of the first order descending neurons, which are situated ventrally, decussate to form the contralateral corticospinal tracts. This means that the right hemisphere's motor cortices mainly control fine movement on the left-hand side of the body, and vice versa. The remaining 15% continue to descend ipsilaterally, forming the anterior corticospinal tract. It won't be a surprise to hear that the lateral corticospinal tracts, as they descend, are arranged somatotopically, with the head end more medial and the tail end more lateral. And that's going to make sense in light of what's about to happen. When the descending first order upper motor neuron has reached the appropriate spinal level, it synapses with a second order lower motor neuron in the ventral horn of grey matter. Up to this point, a motor impulse has been carried all the way from the motor cortex to the spinal level by a single upper motor neuron. The ventromedial location of the synapse helps us to understand the logic behind somatotopic arrangement in the descending corticospinal tracts. Impulses destined for the musculature of the upper body will have to cross this medial synapse and exit the cord higher up than do impulses headed for musculature of the lower body. It makes sense, therefore, for the upper body to be represented more medially in the corticospinal tract and the lower body more laterally. After the synapse, the lower motor neuron leaves the cord ventrally as the ventral rootlet. It then meets up with the dorsal rootlet to form the spinal root. It's worth remembering that it's in the ventral horn of grey matter that upper motor neurons meet lower motor neurons. A lesion to an upper motor neuron typically leads to spastic hypertonia, hyperreflexia and a positive Babinski response, whereas a lower motor neuron lesion leads to atrophy, hypotonia and decreased reflexes. If you have an insult to the ventral horn, such as in motor neuron disease, clinically you might see both upper and lower motor neuron signs. So before we move on to look at some clinical cases, let's have a quick recap. The dorsal column medial lamiscus pathway carries information on fine touch, proprioception and vibration from the periphery up towards the brain. These pathways decussate at the caudal medulla. That means for that for the length of the cord, information runs ipsilaterally. That is to say, the left-sided dorsal columns carry information concerning the left side of the body. The spinothalamic pathway carries information on temperature and pain from the periphery upwards. These pathways decussate pretty much as soon as they enter the spinal cord, meaning that the information is carried contralaterally. The left-sided spinothalamic ascending tracts represent the right side of the body. The lateral corticospinal tracts carry efferent signals from the motor cortices down to control the peripheral musculature in fine voluntary movements. These pathways decussate in the medullary pyramids at the cervical medullary junction. This decussation that means throughout the length of the cord, the lateral corticospinal tracts run ipsilaterally, that is, the left-sided tract controls voluntary movement on the left side of the body. The earlier decussation does, however, mean that the left corticospinal tract receives its input from the right hemisphere of the brain. So now we're going to move on to the clinical cases. 
it's probably a good idea for you to pause the video at this point, have a good read, and try and answer the questions below before moving on to see the answers. So this first case is one of bilateral leg weakness and loss of all sensory modalities below the umbilicus. It's often much easier to make an accurate assessment of where a neurological lesion is likely to be rather than what it is. So we're going to start by trying to suss out a location. Now the fact that the neurology is bilateral and has quite a clear cutoff level at the umbilicus tells us that the lesion is likely to be in the cord. That's not entirely surprising given this is a revision presentation on cord lesions. The umbilicus translates in dermatomal terms to a T10 level, so we're going to be thinking about some sort of lesion around T10 in the cord. The question stem tells us that there's been a loss of all sensory modalities, so that includes fine touch, proprioception and vibration sense. We can deduce, therefore, that both dorsal columns have been lost. Um, just a disclaimer on the diagram here, you can see the cuneate fasciculus is in place. Remember, we're probably around the level of T10, and so in the actual patient, the cuneate fasciculus would not yet have formed in the cord. The loss of pain and temperature sensation also means that the spinothalamic tracts have likely been hit bilaterally. And this lady is exhibiting upper motor neuron signs bilaterally, telling us that the descending lateral corticospinal tracts have likely been hit. So putting all this together, we can say that this is likely to be a pretty comprehensive transverse cord lesion around the level of T10. Now that we've uh, come to a likely location for the lesion, we can start thinking about what the lesion is in itself. I think the most comprehensive way to do this is to use the standard surgical sieve method. The acronym I've learned is invited MD, each of those letters standing for a category of causes. So neoplastic causes such as an intrinsic cord tumour, inflammatory such as transverse myelitis, traumatic such as cord transection, metabolic such as subacute combined degeneration of the cord. Any of these are potentially possible but again you have to go back to the history and think what's most likely. This is a young woman with a history of painful eyes and reduced visual acuity so we might read into that a diagnosis of optic neuritis in the past and that might make us think that this cord lesion is more likely to be inflammatory. So a transverse myelitis, perhaps in the context of multiple sclerosis or neuromyelitis optica. So moving on to case two. Again, feel free to pause the video, have a read, and try and answer the questions before moving on. So the pattern of signs in case two, as represented in this diagram, is a little bit more confusing than in case one. So we need to try and work out where the lesion is to begin with, and let's do that by breaking it down system by system. As can be seen quite well in this diagram, this patient's showing a sort of spinal level, albeit not as clearly cut as in the first case. We could work on the initial assumption, therefore, that this pattern is due to a spinal lesion. He's displaying classic upper motor neuron signs in his right leg, indicating that the lateral corticospinal tract has, at some point during its descent, been damaged. We know that this tract decussates well above the cord in the medullary pyramids, and so can say, because only his right leg is affected, that the descending lateral corticospinal tract has been damaged on his right-hand side. We can deduce the same thing for this gentleman's dorsal columns. He's lost fine touch and vibration sensation in his right leg. And for a spinal cord lesion to do this, it would need to damage the dorsal columns on the right hand side. So this is starting to look like a right hemicord lesion. But you've got to ask why is the pain and temperature loss in the gentleman's left leg rather than in his right with the other neurological deficits? The answer is once again in the anatomy. Spinothalamic fibres decussate as soon as they enter the cord and run up contralaterally, so damage to the right-sided spinothalamic tract results in loss of pain and temperature sensation on the left-hand side of the body. So this is a case of brown saccar syndrome, also known as a hemicord lesion. We might hypothesise that the lesion is around the T11 spinal level, given that the patient's clinical level is just below the umbilicus, which is T10, dermatomally speaking. An interesting question is to try and explain why the patient has an area of pain and temperature loss over his right hip 
That's because the lesion has damaged ipsilateral spinothalamic fibres before their decussation. The right-sided green spinal level isn't really in keeping with the more global spinal level, because spinothalamic fibres as they enter the cord can move up or down several spinal segments in the tract of Lisieux. That means that a hemicord lesion could, potentially, if it were at T11, hit ipsilateral spinothalamic fibres ranging from T8 to L1. So again, now that we've located the lesion, we can start thinking about what the cause of the lesion is. Uh, again, we could use a comprehensive surgical sieve, and that can be useful for Roskies. But given that we have some background on the patient, he's a 78-year-old man with chronic prostatism and lower back pain, we might lean towards a diagnosis of bony metastases from a prostate cancer, say. So again, have a look at this case, pause the video, try and answer the questions, and then move on to the answers. So this is the clinical syndrome in the form of a diagram. Uh, we have bilateral motor and sensory involvement. So again, that makes you think of a cord lesion. Pain and temperature is lost throughout the body, uh, but sparing the face. We could explain that with a lesion to both spinothalamic tracts in the cord, as uh, facial sensation is mediated by the trigeminal system and would be spared by a spinal cord lesion. The patient also shows entire body weakness, again sparing the face. We can explain that with a bilateral lesion to the descending lateral corticospinal tract, um, but like in the previous patients, you might expect that to show an upper motor neuron picture, whereas this patient's uh, not, she's showing a lower motor neuron picture. We could, however, explain that in terms of spinal shock. An acute insult to the uh, descending lateral corticospinal tracts can initially look like a lower motor neuron lesion, and over days or weeks that can turn into the classical upper motor neuron picture with hyperreflexia and, and all the other signs. The dorsal column function is spared, and so we can locate this lesion to the anterior portion of the spinal cord, somewhere in the C-spine, most likely. Again, now that we've come up with a likely uh, location for the lesion, we can start thinking about what the lesion is using a surgical sieve. Going back to the history, uh, this lady had an aortic dissection and her neurological syndrome seems to be a very acute onset. Um, linking those two together, a vascular diagnosis is most likely. We know that the anterior portion of the cord is supplied by the anterior spinal artery, which arises from the two vertebral arteries. A dissection affecting the proximal aorta as well as corrective surgery in which things like aortic clamps are used, can lead to a spinal stroke, cutting off perfusion to the anterior spinal artery and resulting in an anterior cord syndrome, as seen here. So, case four. Uh, pause the video, have a read and try and answer the questions before moving on. So, here's the clinical syndrome represented as a picture. Note that there's a widespread bilateral neurological deficit that affects both motor and sensory function. That very much makes us think of a cord lesion. It does look slightly un unusual though, uh, due to the sacral sparing. So the best way to go about this is to break it down and try and work out where the lesion is likely to be by what structures have been affected. So firstly, there's a bilateral loss of pain and temperature sensation. So it seems that both spinothalamic tracts have been affected. We also have a bilateral upper motor neuron picture below the neck, hinting that both descending lateral corticospinal tracts have been affected. We also have a bilateral loss of fine touch proprioception and vibration sensation, hinting that both dorsal columns are likely to have been hit. So far this looks quite a lot like case, lo case 1, the transverse cord lesion, uh, just perhaps higher up in the spinal cord. But we haven't quite explained the pattern of onset, which was sensory loss over the outer aspects of the arms, which then spread, became more profound, and um, we started to get motor involvement. We also haven't explained the sacral sparing. The unifying diagnosis in this case is a large central cord syndrome. Uh, we can explain the clinical pattern anatomically by noting that the very edges of the dorsal columns, spinothalamic tracts, and lateral corticospinal tracts, which are furthest away from the central canal, are spared by this lesion, by this grey patch on the diagram. If we remember the somatotopic organisation of these three tracts, the more lateral gracile fasciculus uh, carries information on um, fine touch, proprioception, and vibration from the lower body, 
The most lateral fibres of the lateral corticospinal tracts are headed towards the sacral territories, as are the most lateral portions of the spinothalamic tracts. And so a central cord lesion that spares the very peripheries of the cord can result in this clinical picture, a sacral island of neurological normality. We still have to question, however, why this patient presented with a mild sensory loss over the outer aspect of both arms. Unsurprisingly, the answer is anatomical. If the initial central cord lesion was small and very focused around the cord's central canal, initially it would only damage spinothalamic fibres as they decussated directly in front of the canal along the anterior commissure. If this lesion happened to be in the C-spine, then these decussating fibres would be carrying pain and temperature information from the arms, and their interruption would lead to a cape of pain and temperature sensory loss over the arms. As the lesion gets bigger and bigger and begins to interrupt more and more cord structures, the neurological deficit becomes wider spread and more profound until you're left with widespread paralysis, fine touch and pain loss. Again, we can use our surgical sieve to think about likely causes or likely identities for the lesion. Uh, but given this patient's history, she was playing rugby at the time, we might lean towards a diagnosis of syringomyelia, where cerebrospinal fluid builds up in the cord's central canal and eventually distorts the surrounding structures. So this is the last case. If again, you'd like to pause before moving on. So on this diagram, you can see the clinical syndrome, which is bilateral loss of fine touch, vibration and proprioception uh, from the neck downwards. So we're starting to think about a C-spine lesion as the location. Given that there's no pain or temperature loss and that the motor systems seem to be functioning well, we can isolate this pathology quite specifically to the dorsal columns. So having located this pathology to the posterior aspect of the cervical spinal cord, we can start thinking about identities for the lesion. There are quite a few causative pathologies that might fit with this clinical presentation. Given the patient's age and the fact that he doesn't seem to have any back pain, we might lean towards a diagnosis of Tabes dorsalis, which is a consequence of chronic syphilis infection in which the dorsal columns degenerate or maybe a subacute combined degeneration of the cord due to vitamin B12 deficiency. With this latter diagnosis, you would expect him eventually to show signs of lateral corticospinal tract damage, which he's not yet showing. So we've reached the end of the presentation, uh, during which we've recapped the basic anatomy of the spinal cord. We've looked at various different clinical presentations and worked backwards to discover the anatomical basis of these lesions. And we've also learned how to categorise common causes using surgical sieve. If you'd like some further reading on this topic or any other uh, neurological or neurosurgical topics, I would really recommend Neuroanatomy Through Clinical Cases by Hal Blumenfeld. I found that book really useful throughout my medical school career. I would just like to finish by thanking Mr. James Livermore, who's been really helpful uh, in the formation of this presentation, and also Professor Gabriel DeLuca, who introduced me to the idea of localising a lesion before characterising its identity. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope your exams go well.